My friends, welcome back to the podcast and thank you so much for joining me again. This week, I've decided to go solo. <clears throat> Truth be told, I've had a very, very busy uh, couple of weeks and I, my head just hasn't been in the game. I haven't been able to schedule somebody else. I, I've just had too much on my plate. I've just been pardon the term, balls deep in uh, my online business um, that I'm pursuing at the moment as uh, doing affiliate marketing, which I'm loving, but that's just consumed so much of my time. I haven't been able to book a guest. Well, I haven't tried to book a guest, really. Um, But I did think that it's probably long overdue that I introduce myself, I guess, and maybe just give you all a a bit of a rundown on who is Jeremy Strong. Why am I doing this? What do I hope to achieve by doing this? You know, what inspires me? What motivates me? What makes me me? Just so you know a little bit more about the uh, the man behind the corny intros and uh, crazy, silly laugh. So, I'm 27 years old. I live on the Gold Coast in Australia. And I am passionate about freedom and travel. Well, I guess that that is freedom. But freedom, you know, freedom is my absolute motivator. It is my, 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 freedom is my God. You know, it's all I, all I seek in this life experience. And all that makes me feel whole and joyous and fulfilled, you know, is feeling free. Um, so I'll backtrack. I was brought up in Victoria, uh, Melbourne, all over Melbourne. Melbourne, we moved a lot by wonderful parents. Um, a father who has a background in motorsport, and then moved into technology and worked for himself, working with um, Mac, Apple products. Um, and a mother who is a writer and who is quite, who was and is quite heavily involved in personal development. And so I had a very interesting upbringing, kind of both sides of the brain, you know, my mother very creative, my father very sort of um, analytical and technical and, um, you know, dad was like precise and patient and and mum was just like a crazy chaotic mess but fun and alive and, and creative and, you know, from the heart and, you know, so it was interesting but great. And both of them instilled a lot of incredible values in me that, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, Being brought up by quite an alternative thinker of a mother and father to a degree, but but sort of more so mother, uh, was interesting. So, so much, had so much to gain from that and, uh, and also many challenges and hurdles to face. Um, I was home educated for most of my life. I did go to school, to a small community school for, I think it was year eight, I think, um, called Kunara down in Ferntree Gully, I think, in Victoria. And also did year 11 at a school down in Warrenwood in Victoria called the Melbourne Rudolph Steiner School, also quite an alternative uh, style of school. Um, I had a pretty free upbringing. I wasn't really forced to do much at all. My parents were pretty, well, I think dad, dad was working a lot. He wasn't around as much. Mum was pretty okay with me sort of just with us kids having a bit of freedom to sort of be kids and do as we pleased and climb the trees and just play and you know enjoy our childhood like that, which is something that I'm extremely grateful for. Uh, my mother always believed that, 
you know, the time is right when the time is right. You know, when people want to do something, they're much more likely to do well at it or in it. So I know, I know that is true. Certainly for me, I'm sure for all of you as well, when your heart's in something, when you're interested and passionate about doing something, you know, you will give it your fullest attention and, and effort. You know, I, I don't believe in things like ADD and, uh, and so on. I think we all have it to a degree. It just shows up differently in our lives. If, if you were to put me, you know, sit me down in a classroom, in a class that I have absolutely zero interest in whatsoever, I guarantee you I would be ADD AF. <laughs> um, you know, but on the contrary, if you sit me down in, in, in or immerse me in something that I'm interested in, I will be, I will be there. I'll be present. I'll be a hundred percent. I'll be fully attentive and, um, and taking on board whatever I can. So because of that, as I said, I had pretty free roam, roam over my, uh, my childhood, which was great. And when it came time to do school, I was ready and I was willing and I in fact chose to go to uh, Stein School for year 11 and, and do that year. I wanted to go, I wanted to um, sort of, oh, like definitely a lot for the social side of it. As a homeschool kid, you don't get, you know, nearly as much uh, social exposure as you'd probably like or I would go as far as to say sort of, well, need to a degree. Um, that's a pain point that I've had to deal with a lot throughout my life, just not knowing how to how to socialize effectively, really. I, I really struggled. I, I've dealt with a lot of social anxiety and depression based on um, feeling like an outsider in my life. Uh, so anyway, I, I chose to go to school and I, I got stuck into that. And because I, I was really there, I wanted to be there. And... Um, yeah, I was focused. I, I did great. I did well and I really enjoyed it. I had a great year. Um, come the end of year 11, I decided to leave and move on. I was very interested in cars. Motorsport's quite a big thing in my family. I have an uncle who still races in rallies and has a sort of uh, a mechanic workshop that he does a lot of uh, work on rally cars. My father was actually an engine builder for the Nissan rally and then a circuit racing team in the 70s and 80s, I think, uh, in his early career. And, you know, we, were sort of, we sort of grew up going out to the occasional rally and uh, getting involved with the cars, which I, was, I always loved. So uh, between a mixture of that and discovering Top Gear and getting stuck into watching Top Gear as a young, as a young kid, I got pretty into cars pretty quickly and um, decided to go and do my mechanic apprenticeship. So left year 11, pissed off and jumped into that. Mind you, before school, before year 11, I'm going to sort of chop and change and jump around a bit during this, I think, because things are going to come back to me and I'm going to forget and then remember and blah, blah, blah. So excuse that. But um, before year 11, I had already <clears throat> been involved in the workplace, in, 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 the, in the work um, workforce, um, because I was, I've always been more of a hands-on kind of kid, more involved physically with my body, and not so much, um, you know, an intellectual, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I got started working at age 14 and nine months, I think it was. I think that was like the legal age to work in Victoria at the time. Um, so I went to work for a staircase builder, uh, which I really enjoyed. It was really fun. Did that sort of on and off for a year or so. I uh, went to work for a builder, again, sort of did that on and off. And, you know, over those years up, leading up to year 11, I worked for, I uh, tried my hand at a whole bunch of different things from building to carpentry to, you know, the staircase building to a week at Subway, <laughs> which I hated, um, to, I think I did a couple, a couple of days as a stonemason, um, all sorts of bits and pieces, really. And even went and did a building course at TAFE. So that sort of really looked like the path that I was going to go down at one point building, but uh, sort of beneath the surface knew that cars were sort of more my interest. Um, questionable decision, looking back. <laughs> if 
probably could have done a lot better for myself. I went down the building path, but anyway, hindsight's a beautiful thing. Um, and also, you know, having the skill to be able to work on and fix cars is a brilliant skill, and I'm so grateful I did it. Um, I've never paid for anyone else to work on my car the whole time I've been driving or I've owned cars or anything, so that's a huge blessing and saved me shit shitload of cash um, over the years, so grateful for that. So I jumped into the mechanic apprenticeship after school and uh, first two years sort of didn't mind it. Remember getting to the halfway point two years and thinking, fuck this, I hate this. I really, really want it out. Um, worth mentioning to this point that by this time in my life, I had cultivated a belief system in my head that I was an undisciplined human being and that I quit everything I started. Almost had it in my head that I was already a failure at the tender age of like 20. Um, and so it was actually kind of that belief that encouraged me to keep going with the mechanic apprenticeship because I remember saying to myself over and over again, I remember saying, you can't quit this as well, you can't quit this as well, you can't quit this as well, you've got to see something through, you've got to finish something. You know, I had started learning French and quit that. I had done Kung Fu and quit that. I had started hip hop dance and quit that. I did break dancing and quit that. I started learning guitar and quit that. Started learning piano and quit that. Started learning Hebrew and quit that. I'm Jewish by blood. Um, my mother has, is uh, Jewish by blood. You know, goes through the mother's side. Um, and so, oh, so many things. So many things. I've started. I have started and quit. Started and quit. Started and quit. Uh, gymnastics started and quit that and and so I just had this thing in my head that I was like I've got to finish this you know I've got to to finish what I set out to do and so I put my head down and I actually hopped shops I went from the place that I was working and um, which was just a, a run-of-the-mill service center that just did a sh tiny bit of rally stuff and then a shitload of just you know pumping out services service after service after service after service just one after the other, and it was just a horrific place to work. Um, no offense to you lads, if any of you guys listen to this, I highly doubt there will, but if you do, I, you know, I'm sorry. It's just how I felt. Um, so I actually went across the road and, and started working for a bloke by the name of Luke, who had a, a small sort of performance shop, did a bit of servicing and stuff as well, but much more focused on performance stuff. Had a drag racing car. wasn't really interested in that, but you know, it was it was making power, and it was you know, more interesting stuff for a young kid interested in cars. So, um, went down that route and worked with him for a couple of years, which was great. Like he made my life as a mechanic so so much more doable. He was a brilliant boss. He was. I was in bodybuilding at the time. He was as well. You know, so we clicked on that department, the health. You know. We're, into our training and, and fitness and we ate very similarly and we're both addicted to coffee and uh, <laughs> both liked going fast, working on cars and well, didn't really, neither of us really like working on cars, but we liked going fast and we liked doing fun shit. Um, so we got along pretty well and it's, it's great actually, I'm still mates with him today. We get along well, he comes up and visits every now and then up here and he's a good buddy. So that was, um, that was cool, that was cool. That, that made the, the last couple of years really doable the time did come around though, I I decided to, you know, let him know a few months prior to my qualification that I would be walking out the doors when I got that ticket, uh, to which he completely understood. Another great thing about him, he was like, yep, cars, cars suck, I totally understand. <laughs> and it's worth, it's pretty funny actually, because about about a month or two, I think, after I left, he caught, gave me a ring, he said, mate, I just shut the shop, I quit, I'm out, I'm going, travelling around Australia. I was like, you ripper, <laughs> that's awesome. So um, he hasn't set foot, oh, he hasn't uh, worked as a mechanic since either, really, just the occasional tinker, but we both had had enough. Um, so going from there, you know, fitness was my, was a, was a passion. 
been a passion for a long time. I'm 27 years old now. I've been training for, I think, over 10 years now. I think I started training at 16. Um, I'd probably say I'd, I've, been done, I've done 10, 10 years of pretty consistent training now, I guess I'd say. And uh, so my brother was a personal trainer, and uh, he's been a personal trainer for a long time. Very, very, very good at what he does. Very knowledgeable. Um, certainly been doing it for... I think he's been doing it for about 15 years, so very much an, an expert in his field. Um, and so he inspired me to do my PT course and uh, and get into that game. So I did that, went down and uh, moved in with him actually and closer to the city in, of Melbourne and uh, started training people and worked as a PT from a studio and then into a gym. I uh, did that for a couple of years, which was a good experience. I, I liked aspects of it, but it just never really felt like the right fit for me. Um, while I was really passionate about fitness, it's just kind of, fitness is kind of just for me. It's my thing. It's like what I enjoy. It it, it complements my life, but it's not like all of who I am. And, and um, I guess my heart maybe wasn't ever really fully in it. Um, so I... You know, I went through the motions and did it for a while, but sort of knew that it wasn't going to be the, the be all and end all for me. I really didn't um, sort of like the lifestyle of the PT very much. I know a lot of people love it because it feels like a lot much more free than the nine to five. But um, for me, the idea of going to work and then leaving and going home and spending some time at home and then going back to work, I hated that. I hated going back to work. Felt like shit. I was like, huh? I want to go back. I'll just come home from work. <laughs> anyway. Um, learn a lot though, also a good experience. Um, and somewhere during that time as a personal trainer, I decided that, uh, I wasn't finding my thing. You know, I hadn't found my thing. Everything I did just wasn't fulfilling me. It wasn't feeling right. It wasn't that right fit in quotes, whatever that is. It just was another experience and it would come and go and I'd take something from it and then move on and just, I really just felt like I wasn't sure what my place in the world was and you know, like it, it, until very recently even, I really felt like there was just no job out there for me that, it, that exists. I mean, I still think that, I, you know, my belief system now is that I, I need to create the job that's for me, you know, the job that, 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 aligns with with all that I am is my is going to be my creation not uh, something that exists already so I decided that I needed to travel and I needed to go out and broaden my horizons a bit and see some of the world and uh, you know I've heard su I'd heard such incredible things about travel by that point um, from some friends and uh, and I thought well, all these people keep saying that it changes your life and it's, there's nothing like it and you'll, you know, you'll never be the same again. I've got to, I've got to get me some of that. I've got to experience that. So I actually organized my working visa for the UK, um, which was in hindsight a, a, a silly move because I hate big cities and I hate uh, the cold. <laughs> um, anyway, booked a whole bunch of other tours and trips and uh, organized uh, bus about stuff like I did turkey sail, like turkey sail, uh, Greek sail, some bus trips from here to there and all over. It was, it was brilliant time. I'll go into that in detail in a moment, but um, organized all that and gave myself a year to save. I set myself a goal of 20 grand and gave myself to, to depart with um, after paying for flights and all that um, and the tours and everything. And so I decided to work my little ass off. Actually, it wasn't so little at the time. I've been lifting weights for a while by then. <laughs> um, so I worked as a personal trainer in the evenings. I went and got myself a job as a landscape gardening laborer. Did that during the day. And then I would do some mechanic jobs on the weekend as well. So I ended up working six to seven days a week generally starting at 6 or 7 a.m. During the week, I'd start at 6, 6 or 7 a.m. and I would finish work at about 9, 8 or 9 from PT. So I'm working long days and um, and then weekends as well. I was, I was busting ass. You know, I set my sights on this goal and I was like, I'm going to do what 
whatever it takes to have that 20 grand in my bank account by the time I fly out on that day. And I ended up departing, I think, a month after the goal departure date that I had. But, but I did that because when I, had got, when I was close to that departure date, I realized that I'd surpassed my goal and that I had saved, I think I had like 23 or something thousand dollars um, after paying for all my tours and my flights and everything. So I thought, all right, I'm going to make it 25 and just get to 25 grand and then go. So after all, after most of my accommodation paid flights, um, um, you know, tours, all that shit, I think I had about 25 grand spending money and it's one of my proudest achievements to date because money's always been a real um, pain point for me, a real, you know, uh, I've always had a strong sense of lack, you know, of uh, scarcity in that department. So having that kind of money behind me just felt incredible and I felt so proud of what I'd achieved. Um, set out and experienced, I know I said two-year working visa, so uh, stick with me, I'll explain, but experienced the most incredible six months abroad I have ever, well, the only six months abroad I've ever had, but the most incredible six months of my life. It was insane. And I spent every fucking penny of that money I saved, but you know what? Would have spent double. Don't care. That sort of stuff, you can't put a price tag on that sort of stuff. It was six months of living pure freedom. Pure freedom, living every day from my heart. From a place of just love and joy and just wow. Every day was wow. I'd wake up and be like, oh my God, another day where I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and just live my life by my own design, the way that I feel we are all intended to do so. And it's not much that can be said about that. It was just so, it was just such an incredible feeling and experience. I would highly, highly recommend it. There's, there's nothing quite like it. If you've never really traveled and, you know, and, and j just do it. You don't need 25 grand. Shit, I, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like dead set. I met people abroad who'd left home with like 500 bucks in their bank account and they just figure it out on the go. It's insane. Like you can work in bars, you can work at hostels, volunteer at hostels and they, and they you know, give you accommodation and food in exchange. Like you can just figure it out. Like there's so many people traveling that just figure it out. If you're prepared to slum it a bit, you'll have an amazing time. And you'll grow a shitload from the experience. But whatever you've got, like if you're just feeling restless and, and unfulfilled and unhappy and you just know that there's more to life, I couldn't encourage you more to just have some faith, step out of your comfort zone and just fuck off for a while <laughs> and just go and explore. Like and just, just see what there is to see. Like, and experience what there is to experience and learn and grow and immerse yourself in the fucking beauty of planet Earth, of our home. It's amazing. So I got to, anyway, after a little bit of traveling, I got to the UK and um, started to get my, my shit together. And, and shout out to the Global Work and Travel Company who I did all this through. Like, look, you can do it alone. You can go and organize it all and do it alone and save the money. I think they, I think they, it cost me like two grand or something to do it through them. I don't know for them to organize everything for me. But honestly, the service they provided, um, and the ease at which they, they just like everything is just so easy. They just hold your hand, and walk you through. They pretty much don't even hold your hand, and walk you through everything. They just do everything for you. It's brilliant. Like they were really good. I, I had a great experience with them, even though I didn't end up using their services. Not really, anyway. But um, I got there and honestly, with, I, think, I think I was there for eight days. I just remember, just remember getting there and being like, wow, I didn't come. 
halfway around the world to come to a place that doesn't excite me at all. Back to I grew up in Melbourne. It's cold there. Go to London. It's colder and sh the weather's shittier. And just be miserable and fall back into a routine of work and working in jobs that I wouldn't have liked. So just crappy, you know, get you by kind of jobs. And London's a very expensive city and, and sort of all I witnessed was travellers that had gone there with the same intention as me to, to base yourself there, work there and then sort of keep travelling Europe from there like in little bursts. But what they generally find is that they'd get there and start working and find that the living expenses were so high and the wages so low that it just ended up becoming almost impossible to, to make that happen. Um, and so they ended up just sort of being st stuck and uh, I, I hated the idea. You know, I still had sort of half my money in the, in the bank and, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to keep going. I'm having the time of my life. I'm going to go and maybe hit up some sort of cheaper countries and just try and make this money last a bit longer. And, and so from the UK after doing, so what did I do? I did, um, I did, is I landed in Israel originally, went from Israel to uh, Israel's epic, by the way. Oh, what a place. Like <laughs> that was, that was an experience. I, I'm dying to go back there. That was an incredible country to visit. So beautiful, so much history. The vibe in the air there is just unlike anywhere else I've ever been. Really incredible. Places like Jerusalem, like, just blows your mind. It really does. Um, highly recommend it. And Tel Aviv is just a huge first world, incredible, cool, pumping city. It's really dope. Like, it's actually very much like the Gold Coast. Reminds me a lot of the Gold Coast. Good, like for those who are interested in partying, good party scene, good fitness scene, great beach vibe. The women there are fucking drop dead gorgeous fellas. Like it's freaky. It's just weird. You're just like, oh my god, what the hell? Anyway, <laughs> sidetracked. Um, so killer place. Awesome people. Um, from the food. Oh god, the food. Anyway, next. Uh, Israel, I went to, well, I flew into London, got a few things sorted there, then flew back to uh, Turkey, um, did Turkey sail and explored Gorme or um, Cappadocia, the place that you see everyone doing the hot air ballooning in, which was awesome, uh, a place called Olympos, which was dope, they've got these mad like tree houses you can stay in and this like um, there's a little walk up to a side of a hill where there's this endless uh, this uh, fire, fire, these fires that burn forever. It's like a natural gas outlet in the side of a, a hill. And these fires just burn, like just always burning. Like, they never go out, which is pretty sweet. Walked up and saw that. Um, uh, I'm not, I can't go into too much detail, detail with all this. I'll be talking forever. Um, so from, from Turkey, uh, after Gorme and the, and the hot air balloons, I went up to um, Istanbul, which was... Istanbul was cool. Just another big, bustling, noisy city. Didn't do all that much for me, to be honest. Um, but it was cool to see. You know, the, the mosques and stuff are pretty incredible. Um, good food also. From there, got on a bus about tour and went to uh, Turkey, to Greece. Did Greece, did a while in the Greek islands. Amazing. Mykonos, uh, Paros, Santorini and Eos. Awesome, got to do it. You have to do the Greek islands. Everyone does. It's killer. Um, you know, Athens, what a place. That's wild, <laughs> huge, sprawled out, dirty, incredible. Um, continued through Greece. Saw, saw a lot of Greece. Greece went to the Hot Gates, uh, where the movie Three Hundred was, was about, like the place that that that, that was uh, where that war took place. Saw the big statue of Leonidas, which was really cool. Um, kept going, went to Albania, what a, like, what a dope place, Albania was rad, I uh, loved it, really, really cool, up for an up and coming place, I think they've only had cars there, like when I got there, I think they'd only had cars in the country for like 15 or 20 years or something before that, it was like all horse and cart or something, like really young country in terms of tourism, um, and you know, for a while quite dangerous I think, but really good. Great food, good people, really, really beautiful. Um, up to Montenegro, very much similar. Obviously, right next to each other along that coast there. 
Um, similar, beautiful as well, loved it. Montenegro was amazing. And then into Croatia and um, did Croatia Sale and checked out Split and Dubrovnik and, uh, and uh, Zagreb and some places like that, which was really cool. Ah, uh, Zagreb? No, that's a place in Poland, isn't it? Whoops. Zadar, Zadar, yeah. Um, and uh, Croatia was really cool. I have to be honest, Croatia's sort of, you know, become the new hotspot, the new thing. Everyone's talking about Croatia and doing Croatia. And Croatia's rad, but um, I preferred Albania and Montenegro, to be honest. They were just a bit, you know, the, the road less traveled, you know, a little bit more authentically raw and, and um, untouched, which I just like. I think that was really cool. Um, from Croatia, I flew across to Rome and did did Rome for a little while, which, you know, yeah, everyone has to do Rome. Like, what, a, just incredible. Like, I was super into the Romans and that, and that history as a kid. So seeing that was just phenomenal. I just remember being like, damn, <laughs> amazing place. I uh, wandered around there for a while, went to, caught the train up to Pisa. Believe it or not, I didn't even go see the Leaning Tower. <laughs> um, I was only in Pisa for one night because I went up that way to do the uh, the um, uh, Cinque Terre Trail, to walk the Cinque Terre Trail, which was incredible. But... Um, Look, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe I should have gone and seen the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I was, in hindsight, maybe I was just like, well, I was there. I should have while I was there. But I was just exhausted. I was so tired at that point. And I kept asking travelers there. I was like, what's it like? Is it worth it? And most of them were like, eh, nah, wouldn't bother. Um, so I was like, yeah, fair enough. I've seen all the photos. That's enough. Um, so I continued on. Went to the Cinque Terre Trail and walked that and that was cool. That was worth it. That's beautiful. Um, I was traveling solo this, this whole time, just meeting people along the way. And I didn't actually walk the trail with anyone, which was a bit, a bit disappointing. I did it alone. And while it was beautiful, I, I kind of do wish I had someone to share that experience with because it was so gorgeous. And it was such a great walk. Really, really great walk. Um... So I did that and then got to the city on the other side of it, which I always forget which city it was in Italy. Um, oh, I could pull up the map, but I can't be bothered. Um, some port town in, in Italy uh, and just wandered around there for a little while. Nothing too special. It was cool, but whatever. And flew out. And from there, flew to England um, to get started with work. And that's where I decided, you know, after eight days that this was not, this was a no-go. This wasn't going to happen. Um, told my agents. And they were like, yep, okay, you're weird, but right on. See you later. <laughs> no, they went like that. They were great. They were cool. They understood. Um, and so I ducked over to Ireland for a little while to check out Ireland and oh my God, I fucking love Ireland. Everyone, everyone who's spoken to me since I've been traveling has like, you have an unhealthy obsession with Ireland and with Irish people. I love the Irish people. They are my soul brothers and sisters to all you Irish. You're the best. I love you. <laughs> um, which was strange because someone coming, coming from, um, uh, the UK and really not enjoying that experience very much and then just ducking over the ditch and um, to going to Dublin and just having the time of my life. Now, it probably helped that I chose a week in Dublin where the weather was like ace. It was very un-Dublinish apparently. It was beautiful blue skies and sunshine, which really helped. But it's the most beautiful city. It's gorgeous. It's really low. Like They don't have a lot of high rises. They've got like... A uh, law there, I think, about building higher than the church steeple or something in the town. So it's a very low, just sprawled out city that feels more like a town. Um, and it's just gorgeous. It's so beautiful. The people are so friendly. There's color everywhere. The the food's great and wintry and warm and, you know, the beer's good and just the music and the vibe. And I just loved it. 
I would go back to Dublin in a heartbeat. In fact, I could live in, I could live in Dublin. And the reason I didn't stay and, and work and live there was that you know Dublin is actually a part of the, um, the Euro rather than the UK, part of Europe rather than the UK. So I uh, couldn't do that. But I could have done it in Belfast, but I went up to Belfast and I didn't enjoy it as much up there. It sort of just felt a bit more like London. Um, anyway, did, did um, Dublin and went out to uh, Galway, Galway and um, saw the cliffs of Moha um, and a few, a few cool things out there, which was, which was wicked. Galway, Galway is a beautiful town as well. Really cool little, um, it's like sort of traditional Irish town uh, that's quite heavily populated with, I think, university students because I think it's a, it's a uni out there. So great nightlife, great buzz, like the vibe's epic. All these cobbled way streets and uh, cobbled streets and um, beautiful little um, sort of village houses and uh, just, it was, it was rad. I loved it. Um, anyway, met some great people, made some good friends. Shout out to the, the, the spuds over in, uh, in Ireland, which I actually met in Greece, in maybe Eos or something, in the Greek islands, and then teed up with them when I went over there. This is just a travel story, this video, isn't it? <laughs> this podcast. Um, left there and went down to... I think it's important because, honestly, this experience was the defining experience of my life. You know, It really did make me who I am and, and what I am. So left there and went down to... Uh, back to England really quick um, to just, just organise the last little bits and pieces and then, and then depart for good from that place. And... Uh, and I actually had met a bloke in uh, also the Greek islands named Dan, who lived, who was uh, from South Africa, and he was a legend. We just hit it off from work, go, became good mates, and uh, and I was looking for somewhere to go next, so I sent him a message. I was like, mate, I'm going to come down and suss out South Africa and, and catch up with you. And he was like, sweet. So I did that, flew down to Joburg, and... Um, and just proceeded to, you know, he was quite busy with work, so, you know, I couldn't spend all that much time with him, but... Proceeded to have the most incredible experience in South Africa. Also, hi, excuse me, highly recommend checking out South Africa. Oh, Africa in general. I'm dying to... Having done South Africa, I'm now dying to do Africa as much of it as I can. Incredible place. Um, and obviously, I've just barely scratched the surface. But um, from Joburg, went down to Durban. <clears throat> um, from Durban... I just followed the coast all the way down to Cape Town, did the garden route, um, and you know just stopped off at all these beautiful little places on the way down. Just had some incredible experiences, met some amazing people, met my tattoo artist actually. There you go, Baccarelli, the man behind all this. Oh Jesus, I'm confused by the camera thing. Um, all this ink on me. He, I met him and his incredible wife Cody. Uh, in South Africa, and we bonded and became really tight, and um, had some incredible nights there. It was so much fun, um, and from there went on to Cape Town, and again, brilliant place. Love it. Cape Town's rad. Had an awesome time, in Cape Town. Um, just, just yeah, met met some more amazing people. Loved it. Ah, uh, shit, what more to say? I don't know. Went, you know, from, from there, just had an awesome time. Wasn't ready to leave Cape Town at all when my time was up, but um, left and flew to Thailand. Uh, and, you know, just, just this trip just sort of just kept getting from, from amazing to, to more amazing. It was just so good. I just, you know, Thailand's like a bit of a spirit home for me. Love it. I love tropical places. And, you know, Thailand's cheap and beautiful and, Ah, oh, it's just gorgeous. It's just like the environment there. You know, we all have sort of our, our favorite type of, of environment, of, of nature to be in. In Thailand, it's just like, you know, that's my vibe. That, that, that tropical belt of the world, you know, around there. If I'm in there, I'm, I'm happy. Um, so did uh, Phuket and over to... Oh, man, I forget all the names now, but, you know... <clears throat> PP Island and uh, Koh Phangan for for the full moon party, which was dead because the king had just died over there, so everything was like shut down. It was a bit of a disappointment, but you know what? I'm not a big partier, so that worked out for the best, I think. Um. Anyway, 
incredible time in Thailand. Incredible, incredible time. And and Thailand, I uh, I sort of rode Thailand out until I ran out of money. Um, and I got to the point of you know, looking at my bank account and thinking, shit, if I don't go home very soon, it, my parents are going to be paying for my plane ticket, which uh, I knew I couldn't ask them to do. So I, uh, I booked, a, booked a flight home and, uh, and went home just in time actually for my mate's farewell party for him to depart on his travels, which was, which was good timing, you know, for me to come home and just be there to say goodbye to him as he departed and Go to go do his his thing. Shout out to you, Pretzel, Lukey boy. Um, <laughs> so I got home, and and what followed was the the deepest and most severe depression that I've ever experienced in my life. I, I you know I went to a very very dark place, having uh, come from so much freedom and joy and pure, you know, just your life, living each and every moment by my own design, through my heart, living each day, you know, as if, you know, yeah, I've said it all, by my own design, from my heart, you know, the way I wanted, the way I chose. Um, and then coming home with, with nothing, you know, with, with nothing in my bank account and, uh, and uh, no, no real idea of what I wanted to do aside from travel, you know, all I wanted was to travel and to get back on a plane and go again and and I just remember at that point feeling really down and out that I had found something that I loved with all of my heart more than anything else and it's unfortunately quite an expensive thing to do. And as I said earlier, you know, you can, you can leave home with fuck all money and just sort of figure it out on the way. But, um, as a young kid, I, I'll be honest, I just wasn't brave enough. I wasn't brave enough to do it. The idea just scared me too much. It was too, it was too unknown for me at the time. Um, so I just, I felt hopeless, you know, I felt despair and, um, and disappointment and, I even started to feel stupid that I'd gone and, and spent all my money traveling and that I hadn't been smart and used it to invest in something or save or put towards making me more money or something like, you know, like in hindsight, all these ideas come to mind about what you could have done better or smarter or something to ensure that um, the rest of your life can be the way you want it to be. Um, and so, yeah, just, just being back and just not wanting to do anything, not wanting to go back to being a mechanic, not wanting to be a PT, not wanting to, to you know, work my ass off again as a, as a builder uh, or, or a landscape gardener or anything like that. I just remember feeling so desperately hopeless because there was nothing that I was interested in aside from traveling and the idea of putting myself through the ordeal that I had gone through to be able to make that travel happen in the first place, you know, 12 months of such hard slog and oh, just like, it's hard to explain, but that was brutal. You know, the idea of doing that again just made me sick. I was like, no way. I, I couldn't, I couldn't put myself through that again. Um, so yeah, I, I really did fall into a pit of despair and, uh, and spent a lot of my time at home and just, um, dealing with my shadow, my demons and, well, not, not really dealing with them, try, you know, fighting them and <clears throat> even sort of surrendering to them but in a bad way not in, not in the sense that you know you surrender and allow and just observe and then let it pass but in the way of just like yeah you're right I'm 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 hopeless I'm no good I'm a failure um I can't be who I want to be I can't live the life I want to be because I'm just not disciplined enough courageous um smart enough 
resourceful enough, you know, all these, like, I just had all these ideas of, of why I couldn't do and be what I wanted to do and be. Um, and it ended up being my old mechanic boss, Luke, who sort of saved me and got me back on track a little bit, um, because he had gotten into the flipping houses game and, uh, well, he knew I'd done some landscaping work, so he invited me to come and um, work on these places and help him landscape the gardens from the flip. So I went and did that and subbied to him for a while working, and um, that sort of helped me, I guess, pull myself out of the shit for a little bit just to focus on something else and start making a bit of money again. And uh, from there... Actually, what happened then was... It, and that, you know, worth saying that as a young kid, I've always known that I didn't like Melbourne. I didn't like Victoria. It wasn't my place. I've, I've never really liked it. I just always don't like cold weather. Don't like big cities. It's a gray. It's a gray area. It's just ugh. Um, and it's also um, this might sound strange, but like I said before, with the environment, like you know, I love Thailand. I love tropics. I love places like that in terms of just the flora and fauna, you know, like my actual physical environment. It makes me feel good when I'm in those tropical places and Melbourne isn't like that. And I, I just don't like what that place, what that sort of part of the world looks like. I just, it just bores me. It's not my, not my kind of scene. Um, so I've always known ever since we went on a family holiday up to the Gold Coast once, um, that I wanted to live up this way. I wanted to be in Queensland. You know, we did Cairns and we did Port Douglas and the Gold Coast and stuff like that uh, as, as, when I was younger and uh, fell in love with the place and knew I wanted to, to live up here one day. And so, and, and my dad had actually wanted to live up here for a long time as well, go somewhere warmer. Um, and so had my brother. So what happened actually was a beautiful twist of fate where uh, I, you know, was again struggling to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life, and my dad um, and my mother separated. Um, and with that came the perfect opportunity for my dad to, you know, pursue his desire for a warmer climate, and uh, and you know, the opportunity for myself and my brother to relocate with him, which was just, you know, I thank the universe for that one every day. That was just, that was a, that was an incredible turning point in my life. I felt, I, I, yeah, that meant a lot. Um, so while I was disappointed that my parents had, you know, were parting ways, I, I, I saw this incredible opportunity and beauty in, uh, in what was to come from that. And so we moved up, we came up to the Gold Coast to beautiful Burley, uh, heads. We live in Burley Waters, just behind Burley Heads, um, and we all lived together, and uh, did so for just about two years. We're we're just about to part ways now, actually, and make our own way up here, which is very exciting. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm actually, you heard it here first, going to well, 95% sure I'm going to be moving into a van and doing van life, which I'm so excited about. I can't even tell you. <laughs> um, anyway, keen as hell for that. Um, and so I got up here and, uh, just finally, you know, I remember the feeling I had landing at the Gold Coast airport, knowing that I was home and that, you know, I was, well, home, I was here, you know, I was where I wanted to be and, uh, I was, and I was not going, not going back, not going back to Melbourne. Was, there was no return flight. This was it. I was here now. And that made me feel amazing. I was so pumped for that. Um, and from there, you know, I, I dabbled for a while. I still was sort of battling a bit of depression over the coming months. Um, well, actually over the, over the next couple of years or well, year and a half, I still battled with depression up here because the thing is, you know, you can't outrun what's inside. You know, you can change the changing environment was great. It helped a lot. I, I definitely got a lot out of it and it fulfilled a part of me that needed to be fulfilled, but, um, it, it's, you know, it's not everything. It's, just a part of the of the journey, and uh, still had a lot to deal with internally. And um, worked at a cafe for a little while, did eight months there, didn't like that at all by the end of it. Moved on to a warehouse, worked there again, 
you know, both these jobs are minimum wage kind of jobs and just, just getting by. Um, and just, you know, that, that feeling of just, wow, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I turn 26 up here and then I turn 27 and then, you know, there was just that feeling of far out, you know, 27. I'd always have a, a dream and a goal and a vision of being financially free by 30, you know, that was probably my target, it still is my target. Um, and I just remember, you know, every year goes going by and just being almost, almost feeling like I was further away from it than before. And it's funny because, you know, just a quick sidetrack here, I, I look at how close I am to that goal um, as my bank account, what's in my bank account. But the truth is that it's not what's in your bank account that brings you closer to a goal like that. It's what is within you, you know, what you have learned, where you are on your journey. Because, you know, money comes and goes and money can come and go very quickly as well. Things can change incredibly fast when the timing is right and that's why I have such strong faith that this is going to happen because I've known in my head that I'm going to be financially free by 30 my whole life I know that is going to happen and it might not happen the way I see it happening but it's going to happen I have that faith so the bank account looked terrible and that was affecting me a lot and um, just getting by and working in a shitty unfulfilling job just you know, being a shit kicker, as I, as I often said, uh, was damaging my soul. It felt like, it felt like it was, it was, it was, no, it wasn't damaging my soul at all. It was damaging my ego. And, uh, I, I remember very clearly a couple of, a few months ago now, what are we, what are we in April, 2019? So five months ago, Five or six months ago, I remember a phone call with uh, my best mate, Charlie Cat, who was, has been on this podcast. I think he was episode four or five. Um, and we, you know, we discussed this in, in that episode we, we, on the phone. And we, and we remember, you know, both of us have big goals. He, he was also home educated with me. I sort of grew up with him. We have big goals and, and you know, we choose to dream big and go after and, and chase these things. And, um we had visions for our lives and we hadn't you know, sort of fulfilled them or, or felt like we were close to fulfilling them yet. And we, we had this phone call and we said to each other, wow, you know, like, is this it? You know, is life actually just really this hard? You know, like, because it had just been a slog or felt like it was a slog up to here and we were nowhere near. And, uh, and both of us just felt so dejected and so down and just like almost at that point of admitting defeat, almost at that point of being like, wow, you know, like, maybe this is just it, maybe this is just what life is, and we're just going to have to toughen up and knuckle down and just do this, just get by and just pay the bills and live a mediocre life, and that phone call was so, it had this, like, rock bottom effect on me that it was just like, wow, I've like, this is the bottom. You don't get lower than giving up like that, like to that degree. And I remember hanging up and being like, wow, fuck that. I was like, uh-uh, my mama raised me better than that. I ain't quitting. You know, I'm not giving up on myself like that. No way. There is more to life. This isn't it. I can do this. I don't know what it was. I don't know what I attribute that to other than my upbringing from my mother, you know, her relentless look on the positive side, you know, learn from your mistakes, grow, this is personal development, this is a journey, you know, this message that she just kept feeding into me uh, when I was a young boy. And, um, and that, I think that's probably what flicked a switch in my mind at that point and just made me go, all right, nah, -uh. you know, shit's got to change. My friend Megan says, I love, I love this saying, I've used it a lot now. She says, um, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And there, could, there couldn't be anything more true. You know, it's, it's the absolute epitome of truth. You know, it, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and again, expecting a different result. And this is exactly the message behind this. You know, if nothing changes nothing changes. 
And so because I was a bit in a bit of a rut, a bit of a hole in my life, I didn't know where to go and I didn't know what to do next. And I decided to I decided to make a change, you know, I decided that, okay, something needs to change that, you know, that came into my head and I was like, all right, something's got to change. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how I'm going to do it, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea what, what the go was going to be, but I was like, all right, I have to start implementing some good quality, um, messaging back into my life. So I was like, all right, I'm going to read. I hated the idea of reading at the time. I wasn't a reader. I read a lot as a kid. And then I just let it go, um, especially fiction. You know, I read a lot of nonfiction as a kid. I never was into reading fiction, really. I just, you know, I had one of those busy minds, like always wanted to be um, doing something and struggled to just sit down and just focus and just read a book. I, my mind would just go elsewhere and I'd be like, I've read this paragraph four times over. Um, but I decided that I had to do something. I had to make a shame. So I, so I said, okay, I'm going to read for 15 minutes read something good, something quality, something that's going to feed my brain um, and help to change the thought patterns that, that are residing up here. You know, belief is everything. Like, like I, I really believe that. Like, I, I knew that I had to change my beliefs. If I was ever going to get, you know, where I want to be in, in life and achieve what I want to achieve in my life, I have to change my core beliefs, what I believe. Not what you think you believe, what you say you believe, what you believe, what you live. You know, because your actions and how you live are a direct reflection of what you truly believe inside. Um, so I started to read and I just, I made myself read for 15 minutes every morning, every morning before work, just 15 minutes. And before long, I started to really enjoy it because I was feeding myself good quality information. You know, my brain was just soaking it all up and like, yeah, I needed this, you know, such a, such a, such a dehydrated brain. I needed all this goodness. And, um, the more I read, the more I started to notice these positive shifts coming into my life. It was just one thing after the other. It was like incredible. And I started to remember more of these lessons that my mother had taught me, you know, and, and this, the law of attraction, you know, this came back into my head and I was like, wow, you know, it's, it's so true when you align yourself with what you want and where you want to be. And, you know, it, it, these, these things just come to you. They're pulled to you. It's a law of the universe. You can't deny it. It's undeniable. I experience it every time I embrace its rules. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's rules. It's law. You know, like when I, you just, you align and you, you know, the law of attraction is so much more than just sitting down every day and saying, you know, um, saying a quick affirmation. I will, you know, by this date, I want to have this. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's everything. It's full body immersion in what you want now. It's like, okay, this is what I want. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to have, whatever. It's go for it. Go for it. Show the universe that you want it. Show the universe that you have it. You've got to act and visualize as though you have it. Now, here, this moment. And so it's affirmations. It's visualization. It's like meditation on it. It's busting ass, hustling for it. Like the law of attraction isn't about dreaming that you're going to have something and just waiting for it to be delivered on a silver platter. It's showing the universe that you want it. Show in your actions. Actions speak louder than words. Actions will always be more powerful than an affirmation. Always. So I started to, you know, change my train of thought. And, and by changing my train of thought and my, you know, internal dialogue and messaging, I began to act differently as well. And um, with that, so many doors began to open. You know, I had the idea to start a podcast. And that's because I have always felt as though I am very poor at articulating how I feel or, or my beliefs. Um, in fact, this affirmation on the wall you can see here is to do with that. It says, I am impeccable with my word. I am articulate. 
I let go of the misconception that I have trouble expressing myself with words and embrace my natural articulate genius. I am a genius. I am impeccable with my word. And I try to read that to myself every day because it's an area that I, that I perceive to be lacking in my life or weak in my life. And it's the reason or the main driver behind why I decided to start this podcast because I wanted to become better at conversation, at expression, at debate, at articulation. I really wanted to be better at it because so many times in my life I've felt frustrated and eaten up inside that I have something really powerful and meaningful to share and I just can't get it out. It's just trapped inside me and I end up mumbling and stumbling and blur and making a fool of myself, blurting some shit out that doesn't really make any sense and it's just fueled by emotion and not intelligently um, conveyed. And I feel like I'm getting better at it, but I still have a long way to go in that. And that's okay. This journey has been incredible. And this podcast has been a major blessing for me in my life in regards to helping me overcome that. I knew that if I put myself under pressure, because diamonds are made under pressure, you know, you've got to put yourself under pressure. Pressure is what, you know, getting out of our comfort zone and, and applying pressure is how we grow. Iron sharpens iron, they say. Um, you know, I knew that if I put this out to the world, like made this accessible to the world, put this on the internet where everyone can see it, everyone can hear it, it's going to force me to step up and become better. So I did that, you know, I launched this podcast and that's been an incredible journey and I'm so grateful to all of you who listen. It means the world to me, it really does. And honestly, this podcast is for me, it, it, it is for me, but it is for all of you, it is for everybody and it's here for my own personal growth. But if I can help you from this as, through this as well, Oh, you know, that is just, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for the opportunity and for this experience. And honestly, I would continue to do this podcast if no one watched it at all. I'm not in this for the views. I'm in this for, for my personal growth and for the journey and for everything that I'm going to gain from doing this. So on that note, I encourage you to do something similar. It doesn't have to be a podcast, but if, you know, the Go where where you fear. You know, go where you're afraid. Go with what you know, is daunting to you, and what an area that you want to grow. Where you, you know, where you feel you are weak. Go there, and grow from it. You know, it, can, it it doesn't have to be something that's in the public eye. <laughs> um, if that's too much of a, of a of a mouthful to to bite off for the moment, you know, if that's too scary, it's okay. Do something just for you make a private YouTube channel or, or, you know, start doing whatever it is, whatever it is, there's a way, there's a, there's always a way to, to grow in that department, set yourself a challenge, just, just set goals that, 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 that ask you and call you forth, you know, that ask you to step out of your comfort zone, at least for, um, at least, you know, just small bites. That's all it takes. A little bit at a time. Um, and that's, you know, so that's what this podcast has been about for me. Personal growth and, uh, and challenging myself, which has been incredible. And becoming comfortable in front of a camera because, you know, my goal and, and well, not, not goal, my, my, my drive, my, uh, don't really like the word purpose because I feel as though our purpose is what we make it to be and it changes, it's subject to change and I feel as though purpose can be many different things. Our purpose can be many different things and it, it's, it's going to... Our purpose is to live and to evolve and grow as a human being and to, you know, I, I feel like just embrace our potential and... and um, express our potential, become our potential and in whatever that looks like. And it can be one thing and then it can completely change and be another. And I, th I think purpose is a very fluid thing, but, um, you know, but I feel like a part of my purpose, a part of the reason I'm here is to coach and guide and, um, teach young men who have, who have struggled with, um, a lack of direction with identity crisis, with feeling like an outsider, feeling alone, feeling, uh, feeling as though society 
they don't fit into society. And what I would teach and encourage is that it's not that, that, that you don't fit into society, it's that society doesn't fit you. And that's okay. You know, that, that the standard narrative, should I say, doesn't fit you. And that's perfectly okay. You need to go your own way. You need to do you and you need to, you need to, you know, create your own path. Um, I think so many of us, well, I'm getting sidetracked, but I think so many of us uh, expect to find something that already exists that will fit us. But I really believe that for many of us, myself included, it's about creating the perfect fit for us. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I encourage that, that, that mindset shift, that change of perspective and just not seeing it as you don't fit, but that something else doesn't fit you and that that's perfectly okay. And that, that you can, uh, forge your own path. Um, <clears throat> wow. I feel like I've lost my train of thought. Um, per, you know, purpose and, uh, oh, crikey. Um, so yeah, so, so moving into more of a positive mind frame and, and place of being, uh, the two books that I read anyway, that initiated this journey for me were the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, which is so incredible, boring as shit to read, but so much good stuff in there. Really, really worth it. And uh, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Same thing, boring as shit. I struggled really hard to read that book, but so full of wisdom. Really recommend checking them out. Um, and you know what? I'm already over the hour. I think I'm going to leave it here leave you hanging and, uh, and come back for round two, because I think the last four or five months of my life have probably another good hour of podcast in them, because I want to share more with you about, you know, how and why this change in my life has occurred and, uh, what the journey has been like and some of the things that I've learned, some of the resources that have helped me. Um, some of the experiences I've had, I think there's a, there's a lot more that, that, uh, I have to share, um, in, in, in recent times. So I'll call it here and, uh, and there will be a part two, uh, and hopefully in part two, I can sort of dive in, in a bit more depth and give you a bit more value in terms of things that you can do and uh, take on in your own life to help to change your circumstances if you're feeling at all similar to me. Um, so thank you so much for, for tuning in and hearing a little bit about my story. Obviously, that's quite a scattered uh, recollection of my life. I, I didn't go into too much detail. I knew this was going to be a long podcast one way or another. Uh, so that's just a quick one. But if you have any questions about my life, about my upbringing, about my belief systems, about anything at all, I'm an open book, I promise you. I haven't um, left anything out on purpose. I, I really haven't. I'm more than willing to talk about any, anything at all that, you, that you're interested in hearing about. Um, please leave them in the comments or hit me up with a personal message, you know, whatever it is, send me an email, send me a DM, hit me on Instagram, on YouTube, Facebook, whatever. Uh, I'd love to hear from you and I would love to answer any of your questions that you may have. Um, but aside from that, I am about to go jump on a plane to head down to Melbourne uh, to visit Charlie. See you soon, bro. Um, do another podcast with him, catch up with a few other mates, Ills, shout out to you boy, Brendan, shout out to you brother, Baka, my tattoo artist, actually I'm going down for the uh, Rites of Passage tattoo convention in Melbourne this weekend, so Baka's going to do a bit more on my arm, which I'm really excited about, um, and visit the fam, see my sister Leslie, my mother Lilian, um, and whoever else crosses the path. 
Uh, so thank you again for tuning in. Appreciate it. Um, I'm rambling now, so I shall depart. Shall go pack my bags. Uh, have a beautiful day or night or whatever it is, wherever you are. Much love, much appreciation. Uh, and if you are interested in being on the podcast, if you feel you have something to share or just a topic of conversation that would be worthwhile diving into, please hit me up. I would love to, to talk to you and have you on. And, you know, my, my, my goal here is to provide a space to give people a voice um, and to allow you, know, you to express and share what you feel you need to. Um, I think, I personally believe that there is a huge amount of growth to come from, from conversation and from, uh, from connection with fellow human beings. So let's do it. Hit me up. Thanks again. Uh, for the third and final time, peace out. Much love. See you later. Thank you so much for tuning in again. If you would like to support the podcast, the best way that you can do that is to leave a review or if you're watching on YouTube, give it a like and leave me a comment. A huge thank you in advance if you do. I'm extremely grateful. I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast as much as I did and don't forget to tune in next week. New podcasts drop every Sunday. Big love.